Welcome everyone to the 2021 Dirac Lectures. Uh, just to, let me just make a few comments about the, the Dirac Lectures themselves. These are, this is an initiative of the physics department at FSU, the Dirac Lectures, uh, to celebrate the memory of uh, Paul Dirac, the great Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, which as uh, many of you know, uh, who as many of you know, um, uh, after serving as the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University, uh, 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 a position which ended in 1969. Dirac was looking for some place to go, visited FSU and liked it so much he actually came and joined the faculty here and spent the uh, last 10 or so years of his life, life here. Uh, of course, Dirac's contribution to physics are enormous. Uh, in addition to his famous relativistic equation for the Dirac equation for the electron, um, he was one of the handful of physicists in the early heroic days of quantum mechanics who, who really gave birth to, uh, to quantum theory. Thank you. Uh, among other things, showing that the approaches of Schrodinger and Heisenberg, the wave mechanics of Schrodinger and the matrix, matrix mechanics of Heisenberg were really two sides of the same coin. Uh, he also, of course, wrote this uh, uh, classic textbook, which is still quite readable today, which sort of set the standard for some time for quantum mechanics books and the way quantum mechanics is taught. The principles of quantum mechanics. So we like to think that Dirac would have been pleased with the subject of this, this year's uh, Dirac lectures, which is broadly speaking, quantum information science um, and the impact it's had on a, on a variety of, of fields. Really the, 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 the fact that even as we approach the 100th birthday of quantum mechanics, we're still, it's still clear we have a lot to learn, maybe not about the rules for how to calculate with quantum mechanics, but what the implications are, what they, what they really mean about states of possible states of matter and possible possible new kinds of machines one can build and possible new kinds of experiments you can do. So it's a very exciting time still, uh, even, it's, even though quantum mechanics is approaching its 100th, 100th birthday, it still seems to be young. Um, so uh, before I introduce our, our first speaker, let me just quickly show you, share my screen and just remind you of the schedule of lectures throughout the week. Uh, let's see, bear with me, here we go. This you can find this uh, schedule on the web page. Um, we have uh, today's lecture, and tomorrow Steve will be giving another lecture, also at 9 a.m. Uh, and then uh, on on Wednesday we have uh, Martin Savage from uh, University of Washington, um, and then uh, uh, who who'll be talking about uh, connections between quantum information and nuclear physics. And then Brigitte Whaley, an interesting topic. Uh, finding the quantum in biology and possible uses of quantum sensing uh, and uh, uh, quantum technology to do new kinds of experiments in biology. So I think a variety of interesting topics uh, throughout the week, but let me now turn to today's speaker. We're very pleased that our first Iraq lecturer this year is uh, Professor Steve Simon from Oxford University. Um, Steve got his PhD in physics from Harvard in 1995, working with Bert Halpern, uh, and they did a postdoc at MIT with, um, with Patrick Lee. And after that, he went to, to Bell Labs where uh, he stayed for uh, nearly, nearly 10 years, I think. The last eight of which he was serving uh, essentially as the director of the, I think the condensed matter physics group there. Um, and then after that uh, period, uh, Steve, Across the ocean, sort of an elegant symmetry uh, in, in, you know, or invert inversion of what Dirac did. He, he uh, moved to uh, the UK, to Oxford, uh, where he's uh, been a professor uh, ever since. Um, and Steve has made wide ranging contributions to, to, uh, uh, to condensed matter physics and, uh, and also quantum information and quantum computation, covering topics like what I think we'll be hearing about today, topological phases of matter and its connection to quantum computing, um, as well as two-dimensional electrons, <clears throat> uh, moiré materials, a current very exciting topic, uh, cold atoms, quasi-crystals, just many, many superconductivity, many really, uh, basically all, all of the sort of interesting, I would say, quantum-y, uh, well, quasi-crystals, maybe not, but, uh, but uh, it's just a wide range of, 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 of areas in condensed matter physics. And he's also written, uh, again, like Dirac, he's written a, a book, which is uh, 
a widely used book, the Oxford Solid State Physics or Solid State Basics, I guess is the name of the book, uh, mm -hmm. sort of a solid state physics textbook. Um, so uh, I guess without any further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Steve to uh, uh, the Dirac Lectures as our first lecturer and take it away, Steve. Thank you, Nick. Um, well, first of all, um, it's really an honor to be giving the, the Dirac lecture. Dirac, of course, and one of the, the real heroes of, of quantum physics and you know, read many of his papers uh, over the course of my career and, and they're just uniformly beautiful papers. I mean, he's, he was really, he was a master. Um, so the subject I'm going to talk about, topologically ordered matter and, and why you should care, um, it follows uh, in maybe in the tradition of Dirac to some extent. One thing that it does, which is similar to Dirac, is it, it sort of has, has arms that go into many, many different fields of, of, of physics and, and science in general. Um, you know, I, I'm a condensed matter physicist, and so the ideas of topological order are very prevalent in the condensed matter community these days, um, but also in the, in the high energy physics community, uh, the ideas of, of topology have been have been uh, present for uh, a rather long time, and we'll see um, uh, it, 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 as we go on through the lecture that uh, some of these ideas of topology are really important in quantum computation, quantum error correcting, uh, as well. The um, however, the origins of this field go back much much further. They go back to actually the 1800s, which is where I'm going to start the story back before, before even, even Dirac. So in way back in 1867, there were two very well-known physicists living up in, in Scotland. The first of them, probably everyone knows, another one of the great masters, uh, William Thomson, otherwise known as, as, as Lord Kelvin. Probably everyone's heard of Lord Kelvin, and I don't have to tell you um, the many wonderful things that, that Kelvin did. The other one is less, less well-known. is a guy by the name of Peter Tate, very close friend of, of Lord Kelvin. And um, you know, Kelvin lived in, in Glasgow and, and Tate lived in, in Edinburgh. And that's just close enough so the two of them could travel back and forth and discuss physics throughout their lives, which, is, which they, they did. They were very close collaborators and, and, and very, good, very good friends. Now, in 1867, they were actually interested in a phenomenon of a fluid flow. It was a phenomenon that everyone was familiar with in the 1800s. It's the phenomenon of a, of, a, of a smoke ring. Let me remind you what a smoke ring is. So just imagine in the middle of the air, there's an invisible circle like this, and the smoke or, or the air, the fluid, circulates around this invisible circle like this, and the entire thing comes out of the plane of the board uh, at you. Now, back in the 1800s in, in Scotland, they used to do this rather uh, odd thing called, called smoking tobacco. They, people don't do that anymore because they discovered it's bad for you, but I'm told it's a little bit like vaping. And so, you know, you can, a, a talent, one of the great things about giving a talk over Zoom is you have no idea if anyone's laughing at your jokes. So I'll just assume people are laughing and go on. Um, I'm laughing. Anyway, so a, oh, a confirmation of laughing. Very good. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay. Um, well, there will be more jokes coming. Anyway, so, um, you know, but people were familiar with this phenomenon of smoking because, you know, you could, uh, you know, a talented smoker could produce the smoke ring um, uh, while they're smoking. But what Tate did, because he, he was interested in, in, in this phenomenon, is he actually built a machine that creates smoke rings. And it's actually quite easy to build such a machine if you take a a can like a garbage can, you fill it with smoke and you hit the back of the garbage can, smoke rings come out, come out the front. And he, he showed this, um, this device to Lord Kelvin and Kelvin had a number of, of real epiphanies. He was really, really impressed with, uh, with seeing this, wow. Um, and you know, these epiphanies uh, were very important. The, the first one is something that we still teach in undergraduate fluid dynamics courses. It sometimes goes by the name of the circulation theorem. And the content of, of this theorem can basically be summarized by in the following way. If it were not for the fact that the fluid of air, the fluid of smoke, is, um, has friction, it has viscosity or dissipation. If it were not for that fact, 
then this fluid flow configuration, the fluid circulates around this invisible ring like this. It would just go on forever. It would keep circulating around and around and around and around, and around and never stop. And the only reason it stops is because air is an imperfect fluid. It has friction. Um, so it eventually slows down and, and stops. And that got Kelvin thinking, where can you find a fluid that doesn't have any friction at all? Well, such fluids actually do exist. We call them superfluids. An example is if you uh, take helium, regular helium, and you cool it down to just uh, one degree Kelvin above absolute zero, Kelvin, you know, Kelvin gets a uh, credit for that. Um, then uh, it be does become a, a superfluid. And if you start a, the fluid flowing in this, in this sort of uh, ring configuration, it really will continue f uh, flowing in that way, really essentially forever um, without, without stopping. However, Kelvin didn't know about superfluid helium. Uh, he didn't have any cryogenic apparatus to cool anything down to, to close to absolute zero. And furthermore, in 1867, uh, the element helium hadn't even been discovered. So he didn't know about that. But there's um, something he thought he knew about, which he thought was just such a perfect dissipationless, frictionless fluid. And this thing that he thought he knew about was a famous mistake in the scientific literature. And it's known as ether. So what is ether? Ether is supposedly a perfect dissipationless, frictionless fluid that fills the entire universe. And its, and its purpose is to carry electromagnetic waves like, like light. Um, and they, the scientists of the 1800s believed in this ether stuff for very good reason. They knew a lot about waves. And they knew that when you, you, when you see a wave on the water, what you're actually seeing was um, water really sloshing back and forth. And when you hear a wave of sound in the air, what you are actually hearing is the air moving back and forth. And they knew that light was a wave, or at least it had wave-like properties, and, but they didn't see anything moving back and forth, but they hypothesized that such uh, material should exist, and, and they called it ether. And, and they knew that this ether stuff had to be extremely dissipationless because you can see uh, light from stars very, very, very far away. And if there was any friction or loss in this ether, you wouldn't be able to see the stars that are very far away. Now, the idea of ether actually goes back way before Kelvin. It actually goes back several hundred years before him to the famous French philosopher, René Descartes. Uh, Descartes um, thought this stuff up. He, he said, well, I think therefore it is. And he created the ether. That was another joke in case you missed it. But it really is, is due to Descartes. And the arguments for ether were actually seemed extremely convincing. And pretty much every scientist in the 1800s um, believed in the existence of this, of this ether. So on the one hand, Kelvin believed in ether as did everyone else uh, in the world at the time. And on the other hand, he had his circulation theorem that tells him if you have a perfect dissipationless fluid, then these, uh, these flow can would continue on uh, forever. Um, so what then is, does it mean to have this sort of smoke ring in the ether? And he came to a really remarkable conclusion. He said, well, this smoke ring in the ether, maybe it's an atom, like a hydrogen atom, like this. And you could have, he, he imagined, uh, something more complicated, like uh, say two linked rings, like this. And the fluid would flow around this ring like this, and around this ring, like this. And due to the circulation theorem, this fluid flow configuration would be completely stable. It would last forever. And maybe this is something like a uh, hydrogen molecule. And then you could have something even more complicated, maybe something like this. Let's see if I can do this without making a mistake. Um, it goes over, this goes under. So you have a little bit of a knot. And then the fluid would flow around it like this, and the fluid would flow around it like this, and around it like this, and so forth, and so on. And this could be a more complicated atom, like maybe, maybe, like maybe lithium. So this idea, um, known as uh, Kelvin's vortex theory of, of the atom, um, sounds completely nuts to us right now because we know what atoms are made of. They're made of protons and neutrons and electrons, and they have nothing. We know ether doesn't even exist, um, and we know you know this has nothing to do with what atoms are. But in the eighteen uh, in the eighteen sixties and seventies, it actually sounded like a really good idea. And many very, very serious scientists, people like, besides Kelvin, people like Maxwell, people like Helmholtz, people like Kirchhoff, um, uh, really worked on this theory. And they tried to learn something about the periodic table 
of, of the elements by understanding uh, these sort of fluid flow configurations in, in, in the ether. Now, right off the bat, there were some people who criticized the theory. And one of the people who criticized the theory was, was Peter Tate. And Peter Tate said, well, you know, it's, it's a beautiful picture, but it um, doesn't predict anything useful about the atoms. You, you know, a theory of the atoms should predict, you know, the atoms masses, their electrical properties, their optical properties, their chemical properties. And this supposed theory doesn't predict anything. So for a number of years, maybe about a decade, Peter Tate more or less ignored this vortex theory of the atom. And what did he spend his life doing? Well, he worked on a lot of other things, but also he spent a lot of time golfing. Peter Tate was a fabulous golfer. He was also a fantastic rugby player. And he spent a lot of time doing those things. He had a son named Freddie, Freddie Tate. And if anyone's a super golf fan, you will know the name Freddie Tate because he became a champion of the British Open. And there's, and there's, there's still a Freddie Tate cut, which is awarded every year. Um, so if, if you really know about golf, you'll know about Freddie Tate as uh, Calvin's son. So he went golfing with his son um, uh, an awful lot during this period. At the end of those 10 years, pretty much most of the scientific community had given up on the vortex theory of the atom for exactly the reasons that Peter Tate had mentioned, that it just didn't seem to predict anything. No matter how much they tried, they couldn't learn anything about the periodic table of elements by looking at these sort of uh, fluid flow configurations. Um, but Peter Tate came back and looked at the theory again, and he said, well, you know, maybe it's not so obvious how this is related to the periodic table of the elements, but maybe the reason that we don't see the connection is because we don't understand enough about knots. This is the simplest knot. This is the next most simple knot. This is the next most simple knot. Peter Tate thought, well, maybe if I had a periodic table of all the possible knots, I would be able to make some relationship to the periodic table of the elements. So he decided that what he was going to do with his scientific career from then on, um, he worked on some other things as well. He actually, um, he was instrumental in putting the dimples on golf balls, realizing that that, that would help their aerodynamics. But, but he, he spent an awful lot of time studying knots, building a periodic table of, of all the possible knots. And Peter Tate became um, what we view now as the father of, uh, of Branton mathematics, which is the study of knots, which we call knot theory, um, which is an extremely rich and extremely beautiful and extremely important uh, branch uh, of mathematics. He was way, way ahead of his time mathematically. Some of his conjectures about uh, the theory of knots were not proven until after the year 2000, um, opened up a, a great number of, of new directions in, in mathematics. Of course, he didn't get any closer to understanding the periodic table of elements. So I will, at some point, I'll, I'll, I promise I'll, I'll go from the story and go, go back to, to physics, uh, well, eventually. But, um, but bear with me, because I have to tell you the end of the Peter Tate story. So the end of the Peter Tate story, it, it gets to be around 1900. And Peter Tate is getting, starting to get a little bit depressed, because he spent a lot of time learning about knots. And he's no closer to learning anything about the periodic table of the elements. And he writes some letters to his friend, Lord Kelvin, talking about how he feels like he's wasted so much effort on this and he's learned nothing. Of course, he has learned something. He's learned a lot about knots, but he's learned nothing about the periodic table of the elements. Um, but then feeling rather bad about his, his career, the next year, 1901, his son, Freddie, the champion golfer, was killed in the Boer Wars in, in South Africa, very fairly young. And that put Peter Tate into a terrible depression. And, and he dies uh, just a few months later. Very, very sad, obviously, at the loss of his son, but also having feel feeling like he had wasted so much of his productive scientific career on this theory that wasn't going anywhere. Um, now, he didn't realize that his work on knots was going to be extremely influential and it was going to open up lots of important um, branches of mathematics and also of physics later on, but not in the way he thought they would. So what was it that Peter Tate learned that was so important? So Peter Tate put his finger on the, on the, you know, the fundamental question in the field of knot theory. So the fundamental question, and let me draw two pictures of knots, a really simple knot, just a loop like this, that sometimes called the unknot, um, the simplest thing you can make with a, with a piece of string, with no ends. And then I'm going to make a slightly more complicated knot over here, so something that looks like a complicated figure eight, like that. And the fundamental question in knot theory is that are these the same knot or are they different? In other words, can you somehow unentangle this thing 
and turn it into this thing without using scissors? Can you just stretch and pull and, and somehow work it around until they, they're basically the same, the same thing? Now, it's pretty, if, if they are the same, we call them topologically equivalent. And if they're not the same, we call them topologically inequivalent. It's a question of whether it's one entry on, on Peter Tate's periodic table of knots or if it's two different entries on, on the periodic table of knots. So, um, and you know, we're pretty smart people and we can look at this example and we can see that all you have to do to turn this picture into this picture is just unfold this top piece here and this bottom piece goes under there. And then you realize that this picture here is really just the same unknot as we over have over here. So these two are in fact topologically equivalent. They're really just one entry on the periodic table of knots. However, when you have more complicated knots, it rapidly becomes extremely difficult to tell when they're the same and when they're not. Um, for example, if you look at this knot known as the trefoil, um, it turns out that this knot is actually not equivalent to its mirror image. And it wasn't until about 20 years after Peter Tate's death that someone managed to prove that the trefoil and its mirror image are actually distinct. They can't be deformed into each other. So what Peter Tate realized is in order to distinguish knots from each other, you need a tool, a mathematical tool that will help out. And in, in modern parlance, we call this tool a knot invariant. And a knot invariant is basically a mapping from an input, which is a knot or a picture of a knot, to an output. output. And the output can be, uh, it can be any one of a number of things, like a number or a mathematical polynomial or an element of a group, some symbol. But the important thing is that the mapping should be via a set of rules and the rules should be cooked up such that it's a topologically equivalent knots have to give you the same output. Let me repeat that. The rules are cooked up such that the topologically equivalent knots, two knots that can be deformed into each other must give the same output. So suppose you have two really complicated knots and you don't know whether they can be deformed into each other or not. You stick them both into your set of rules, you turn the crank and you get two outputs. If the outputs are not the same, you know that there is no way to deform one of them into the other without cutting. That's how knot invariants work. So you can imagine that this is a rather useful thing to have if you're trying to build your periodic table uh, of the knots. Now, in order to show you how these knot invariants work, I'm going to define a particularly useful knot invariant, uh, which is actually not something that was known to, to Peter Tate. It wasn't discovered until the 1980s. Uh, sometimes known as the Kaufman, uh, Kaufman bracket, Kaufman invariant, Kaufman bracket. I'll just name it after Kaufman here. It's named after its inventor, who is Von Jones. Named Von Jones. Okay, that was a joke. Obviously, it's not named after its inventor, Von Jones. So Von Jones is a, a very famous mathematician um, who just passed away uh, less than a year ago, I think. Um, very young, actually. Um, and Von Jones won, won a Fields Medal for his work on uh, the mathematical theory of, of knots. Fields Medal is like, is like the Nobel Prize of, of, of mathematics. Now, now Kaufman is uh, also a mathematician, Lewis Kaufman. He's, as far as I know, he's still very much alive um, at, um, in Chicago. Um, and what Kaufman did, which I think is at least as important as what Von Jones did, is he took what Von Jones was doing and he simplified it so much that I can explain it to you in just a few minutes. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna explain um, what Von Jones was doing in, in just a few minutes. And, and this is why Kaufman gets his name attached to it because Kaufman's version of what Jones was doing is really, really very simple. So to define the Kaufman bracket invariant, um, first thing you need to do is you need to choose a number. We'll call it A. A stands for A number, okay? For now, we'll just leave it as a, as, as a variable, but sometimes I crack myself up with these stupid jokes, okay? But, um, you know, you have to get some, if you don't entertain yourself, you're not gonna entertain other people. Anyway. We're entertained, so, we're entertained. <laughs> it's like the scene from Gladiator. Are you not entertained? Anyway, so you choose a number. Right now, we'll just leave it as a variable, but, um, but later on, we might give it a, a, a value. Um, so that's, that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing is, is a rule. It's a simple rule that if you ever have a loop of string, you can replace that loop of string 
with a particular mathematical value, minus a squared minus a to the minus two. And that combination, minus a squared minus a to the minus two, comes up so frequently, we give it its own um, name. We call it D. So a loop of string like this, without anything going through the, the loop of string, nothing knotted through it or anything like that, just a simple loop sitting by itself is, is worth D, okay? That's the first rule. The second rule is a more complicated rule. So let me uh, try to explain it. If you have a picture of a knot with a crossing that looks like this, you can replace that picture with a sum of two pictures. And the first picture, the two strings go in the vertical direction. And in the second picture, the two strings go in the horizontal direction. And then these pictures get prefactors of A and A inverse. Okay, so what am I doing here? What I'm doing is I'm doing some sort of um, algebra with pictures. I took one picture, I replaced it with two pictures with a plus sign in between and with coefficients out front. Okay, if it's not clear what I'm doing, um, I'll, I'm going to make it clear in a moment by doing an example. Um, okay, so this is the, the harder rule. Now, really, these are the only two rules we have, but I'm going to cheat a little bit and draw a third rule. And the third rule is exactly the same as the second rule. It's just all the pictures are rotated by 90 degrees. And um, so, so really, it's the same rule, just looking all, at all the pictures from the side. And the reason I'm drawing this rule twice is because it's a lot easier to draw the rule twice than it is to ask you to rotate your head at a later point in the talk in a few seconds. OK, so now we have our rules for the Kaufman um, bracket invariant. And I'm going to demonstrate how this works by evaluating the Kaufman invariant for this sort of figure 80 looking thing, figure 8 thing that we um, drew up above. OK, so I'm going to try to evaluate the Kaufman invariant of this knot here. So how do we do it? Well, first thing we do is we look here and we see that there's a crossing of strings. And this crossing of strings looks exactly like this crossing of strings, okay? So we can replace that crossing with A times vertical plus A inverse times horizontal. And everywhere else in the picture, look is it's gonna look exactly like it does over here on the left. So I'm gonna fill in everything else, uh, closing up on the top like this. And then on the bottom, it has to cross over once like this. And it has to cross over once like this. OK? So are there any questions about that? Or is it clear what I did? OK, if you understand this, you're going to understand, you're going to understand everything. This is a, the most important moment of the day, OK? Maybe the most important moment of the week, uh, at least the most important moment of the talk at any rate. OK, so we've, we have now have these pictures here. And each of these pictures has a crossing too. So we'd like to get rid of those crossings. So what we can do is we can look at this crossing and we say, oh, this crossing here, it looks like this crossing here. So let's use this rule to get rid of that crossing. So here I'm gonna write an equal sign and then um, let's bring down this, this factor A out front. So I'll put an A out front. I'll even open up a bracket like that. And then I'm going to use A times horizontal plus A inverse times vertical, and then fill in everything else just like it is up here, okay? So uh, close the bracket, and I have to fill in everything else like it is up there, so it kind of looks like this, and then kind of looks like this. And then do the same thing for the second term, bring this guy down. So we have A inverse, open up the bracket, and do this real quick. We have A times horizontal plus A inverse times vertical, and then everything else has to look exactly like it does up here. So we have a loop, and then like this, we have a loop, and then like this. Okay, so now I have, um, uh, I've removed all the crossings from my picture. So everything that's remaining is, is just a loop. And remember the first rule up here is that a loop is gets the value d. So I'm going to replace every loop by a factor of d. So this now becomes, uh, from the first term, I have a squared. That's this a times this a. And I have two loops, this one and this one. So I get d squared. And the second term, we have a canceling a inverse. I have one big loop, and that's worth d. We have a inverse canceling a. I have three loops. 
So that's d cubed. And then I have a minus 2 times d squared. Okay. Uh, we're almost there now. It's now we have no more pictures. We just have mathematical quantities and we just do a little bit of simplification. So I'm going to steal this here. Copy, copy this. So this, this you can't do on a chalkboard. It's very convenient to be able to do this. Um, paste. So I'm going to notice here, wall this off, that um, I have an a squared and an a to the minus two. A squared plus a to the minus two is actually the same as minus d. So these two terms can come together to give me minus d cubed. This minus d cubed can cancel this d cubed. And at the end of the day, the only thing that's left is d. Yay, that's the end of the calculation, okay? So why does that get a yay? Why is that so exciting here that it gets a yay? Um, well, um, at the beginning of the calculation, I started with this sort of uh, funny figure eight looking thing. But secretly, I knew that that um, uh, figure eight looking thing is really just a single loop. I tried to twist it and make it look more complicated, but it's just, it's just a loop. Um, and the value of a loop from way up here is D. Uh, that was one of our rules, a single loop gets D. Now I tried to make the loop look a lot more complicated, but when I calculate the Kaufman invariant, what comes out at the end of the day is still just D. So I could have folded over the knot a um, you know, hundred times or a thousand times and made it look really super, super complicated. And still at the end of the day, you're gonna get D, okay? So you might think that this is a really useful thing to have if you're trying to build your periodic table of knots and you want to distinguish knots from each other. Okay, is that clear? Okay, no questions. Good. So you might think this is a useful thing to have if you're building a, a table of the knots. Then you might think about it a little bit more um, carefully and you might realize that actually it's not so useful after all. Why not? Well, the problem is that it's computationally difficult to calculate the Kaufman invariant in the following sense. In this um, picture here, I had two crossings and I ended up with four diagrams. If I had three crossings, I would have had eight diagrams. Four crossings, I would have had 16 diagrams. And generally, if I have n crossings, um, I would get uh, two to the n diagrams. And the problem is um, it's really super easy to draw a picture of a knot with 100 crossings. And unfortunately, uh, 2 to the 100th power is such an enormous number that even on the world's biggest computer working for 1,000 years, you would never be able to enumerate all of those diagrams. So that might make you think that this actually maybe isn't so useful after all. We'll come back to that in, in, in a moment, OK? So with this introduction to mathematics, let me then switch gears and talk about something which sounds like it's completely different, but actually is, is really the same thing. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, what's known as a topological quantum field theory. Uh, quantum field theory. Field theory. Theory. And um, that's essentially equivalent to topologically ordered matter. Ordered matter. Uh, the distinction is a very subtle uh, grammatical one. Uh, topological quantum field theory is something that you write down on paper, and topologically ordered matter is a physical thing in your laboratory, which is described by the topological quantum field theory that you wrote down on paper. Okay, So uh, anything that is described at low energy and long wavelength by a topological quantum field theory is known as topologically ordered matter. Um, that probably does not help you understand at all what either of them are, except to say that they're the same thing. Um, so let me explain what they are. So this is any um, physical quantum mechanical system where amplitudes or probabilities, we know in quantum mechanics, you square an amplitude to get a probability, amplitudes uh, uh, depend on topology, topology, not geometry. OK, that is also something that may sound a little bit obtuse. So let me try to put a little bit of flesh 
on that, uh, on that uh, definition. So let me try to draw a, so actually I should maybe warn that um, uh, for the rest of the day, everything I'm gonna talk about physically is a two-dimensional system. So a, a physical system on a two-dimensional surface. And I'm going to draw time as the third direction. So here I'm gonna draw a two-dimensional system, maybe a disc like this. Here's a disc, two-dimensional system um, like that. And time is gonna go up in this direction. Oops, that's not going, it's not a single line like this, like that going up. And time goes up because time is money and money goes up, something like that. Anyway, um, so we're gonna imagine that this two-dimensional system here starts and it's, it's a gap system. There's no low energy excitations. It's sitting there at, at close to zero temperature and it's, and it's sitting in its ground state, not, not doing anything exciting. It's just sort of sitting there. And if we, and we just let it, you know, let it by itself, it would just sit there in its ground state and not do anything exciting. However, we can decide at some point that we would like to add some energy to the system. So we send in a, um, maybe a photon or a phonon in order to impart energy to the system. And by doing this, we create a particle-antiparticle pair. Um, this, is, this is basically, you know, E equals MC, MC squared. You put in some energy and you get out two particles um, uh, that have, have mass, um, particle and, and it's antiparticle. And then maybe we can do that again at some later point here. We'll put in some more energy and um, uh, get another particle antiparticle pair, a particle hole pair if you're a, a condensed matter physicist. And then maybe let's drag one of them around the other like this, and then bring them back together at some later time. Oops, draw that better. Like this comes back together at some later time. And then this one comes back together at some later time. Now, what happens when the particles come back together? Um, several things can happen. Um, one thing that can happen is that they can re-emit the energy in the form of, of say photons or phonons that you put in. And then the physical system goes back to its, its same ground state that you started with. So you put in some energy and you get out the energy and get back to the ground state. Um, but there's another possibility of what can happen is they can form a bound state um, that refuses to go, go away. That you know, bring the particles back together and instead of reannihilating, they form uh, some stable bound state that does not uh, reannihilate. And um, it shouldn't surprise us that more than one thing can happen. So we, we're familiar with that in, in, in quantum mechanics uh, all the time, um, the, that the result of, of, of experiments can be, can be probabilistic. Um, but what, um, so you know, the, there's probably amplitude for one thing happening and there's probably amplitude for another thing happening. And you know, the, if you want the actual probabilities, you square the amplitudes to find out whether the particles annihilate or whether they uh, form a bound state. Now, what's interesting about topologically ordered matter or topological quantum field theory is the result of this experiment does not depend on the details of what I did here. So for example, I could change this picture here like this into a picture like this, okay? I didn't change the topology of, of this picture, but I changed the geometry. I can make another change over here. Um, this, maybe make it look kind of like this instead. Again, I didn't change the topology, I changed the geometry. The statement is that the amplitudes, the probabilities of the different possible outcomes depends only on the topology, not on the geometry. So you can you know, make a measurement of the probability of the two possible outcomes, either annihilating or, or not annihilating. And the only thing that that amplitude or that probability will care about is the fact that I took these guys around each other to form a knot. It doesn't care about the particular shape of the curves that I, you know, and exactly the exact paths that the, that the particles took. And that's what I mean by saying the amplitudes depend on topology not on geometry. Now, if you think about this a little bit more carefully, what you'll realize is that the amplitudes uh, are then precisely not invariants. 
invariance. Why? Well, it's a mapping from an input, which is some not, here's some, some not, to some output, which is the result of your experiment, the probabilities of the outcomes of the experiment, that depends only on the particular knot. You can deform the knot in any way you like. And as long as the same knot, um, you know, it can, one can be deformed into the other without cutting, you get the same probability amplitudes as, as, as your output. So this connection between uh, topological quantum field theories and uh, knot invariance was made rather famously by, by Ed Witten uh, in 1989 in a rather, rather famous uh, groundbreaking paper. Witten won the, the Fields Medal um, in, in mathematics, along with Von Jones for his work on, on knot theory. It's a rather beautiful paper, which opens up a, a, a huge number of, of new fields um, by making, in very, very um, uh, sophisticated ways, making the, it exploits this connection between amplitudes and uh, topological quantum field theories and, and knot invariance. Um, now, it, it should be, uh, a little bit surprising to us that, uh, that you can have physical systems with this, this property that they should only depend on uh, topology, not geometry, because we're, we're used to the idea that in quantum mechanics, when you calculate some outcome of some experiments, details really matter. That it matters uh, how fast the particles are moving. It matters uh, how close the particles got to each other. It matters how long the particles lived between the time you created them and the time you tried to re-annihilate them. Um, and here I'm telling you for these type of topological theories, um, those things don't matter. The only thing that matters is the particular knot that you formed in your space-time uh, diagram, okay? Um, now in this, in this groundbreaking paper, one of the things that, that Witten did is he made a connection between topological quantum field theories that were known and and, and understood to some extent already, I mean, to a large extent by, by himself, uh, having developed uh, the theory of, uh, but also by a lot of uh, mathematicians and particular knot invariance. And in, in particular, um, well, okay. So you, you have to, um, there's a particular type of, 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 of topological quantum field theory described by a gauge group SU2. We know SU2, it's a, um, uh, you know, rotations of, of, a, of a spinner, um, that, that becomes the gauge group of the topological quantum field theory. And then it needs a coupling constant, which you write as a subscript K. K has to be an integer for consistency of the theory. Turns out it has to be an integer. K is an element, is an element of the integers. And for these particular um, topological quantum field theories, the, the, the amplitude is actually uh, actually equal to amplitude is actually equal to the Kaufman invariant of the knot, Kaufman bracket of the knot, um, given a particular value of this constant A. Remember that, that A equals A number, you must put in uh, the value I times e to the I pi over 2K plus two. So you input um, this number into your Kaufman invariant of your knot, and it will tell you the probability of amplitude for all particles to annihilate. All annihilate, annihilate is given by uh, up to a normalization given by the Kaufman invariant uh, with its value of, of A, okay? Now, rather surprisingly, um, these topological quantum field theories are not just a figment of, of Ed Witten's overactive imagination. Probably a lot of you know the name Ed Witten. He was for a very long time the world's most prominent, and still maybe the world's most prominent string theorist, um, uh, you know, the, the source of many, many great and, and beautiful advances in both mathematics and, and physics. Um, so this is not, as I was saying, this is not the, you know, just a big uh, uh, part of his imagination, but there are physical systems that actually behave this way. So let me make a, a list. So assuming we stick with the gauge group SU2, which is the most common one to find in nature, although people have discussed other ones as well. Um, so in, in, the, in, the, in the category K equals one, SU2 level one. So these are what are known as abelian, uh, abelian states. I won't explain what those are yet, um, but in the category of abelian states is basically most fractional quantum Hall effect uh, 
And so fractional O'Connell Hall effect is something that occurs in two-dimensional electron gas under magnetic field. And if we have time, I'll, I'll say a couple words about that at the end. Um, SU2 level two, it also occurs. And this, if you've ever heard the word Majorana, that's very closely related to SU2 level two topological quantum field theory. There's a number of things that fit in this, the so-called new equals five halves fractional quantum Hall effect. There's um, a number of, of, of uh, superfluids and superconductors that fit in this category, helium 3A films. So remember helium three is uh, you know, helium with three nucleons rather than four nucleons. And if you cool that down to below one millikelvin of temperature, it becomes a superfluid and then you make a two dimensional film out of it. It fits in this category as well. And then there's some materials that people are very excited about now, uranium tellurium two, iron uh, tellurium 0.55, selenium 0.45, and there's a couple of others that they think fit in this category. And then a vast number of engineered Majorana materials um, being invested uh, into by Microsoft, uh, Majorana uh, materials, uh, usually involving things like um, uh, antimony, indium, arsenic, aluminum, all sort of globbed together in a very clever way to try to try to engineer this SU2 level two um, topological quantum field theory. There's SU2 level three. There's only one of these that we know, the new equals 12 fifths fractional quantum Hall effect. There are a few other things out there as well um, that, that people discuss. Okay, so let me, um, uh, oh boy, I'm running out of time, aren't I? Let me um, uh, mm, skip that page. Let me just say a couple words about what's, what's kind of interesting about these um, uh, topological quantum systems, which is, which is unusual, or one of the things that's, that's a little bit unusual about these topological quantum systems, as the following statement. Um, let's imagine we have our two-dimensional two system here. And let's imagine we put in the system um, two particles and two antiparticles, two particles and two holes. We have a two-dimensional system. Time is always going vertically. And this is my, my physical system with two particles and, and two holes. Now, in, in most physical systems that start with, with a gap to excitations, like a, an insulator or a superconductor, um, then if I tell you I start in the ground state and I add a particle here, a hole, you know, a particle here, a hole here, a particle here, a hole here. I have told you the entire wave function. You know, if you start with some, some particular state, a ground state, and I hit it with a creation operator, an annihilation operator, a creation operator, an annihilation operator, I basically told you the whole uh, wave function uh, of the system. But that's actually not true in, uh, in topological systems. I'm gonna make a copy of this, um, copy paste. Um, in topological systems, you can have two linearly independent states, which look exactly the same. And the, you know, the, they're, they're physically different, even though they're both described by start with the ground state and put a particle here, a particle here, a hole here, and a hole here. And the reason they can be different in topological systems is because they can have different space-time histories. I could have pulled again, time going vertically, I could have pulled these two apart from each other from the vacuum, or I could have pulled these two apart from each other from the vacuum. And these are topologically distinct, okay? And to convince you that these are in fact different, uh, what we need to do is we need to, um, let's see if I can do this, we need to construct the corresponding um, bras to go with these kets. Uh, let's see, I can do this, paste. Uh, oops, uh, okay. All right, these are supposed to look in the same, um, supposed to look like the same system here. Same system, supposed to look the same. And then here, same system again, supposed to look the same. Up here, paste, yeah, okay. And if I wanna make the, the corresponding bras, I do the same thing, but I, I time reverse. I return them to the vacuum this way, and two, return to the vacuum this way, okay. And to convince you that, uh, or not, in order to calculate the inner product between one and two, um, what I, let me move closer like this, to, make, to find the inner product, what I need to do is I need to bring them together to make, to bring the bra, you know, squeeze the bra together with the ket. 
So for example, if I'm trying to calculate one, one, I have my physical system in the middle. There's a particle, there's a hole, there's a particle, there's a hole. It's a uh, ket on the bottom like this. That's the same ket as I have here. And then bra on the top like this. And that's the same bra as I have up here. So I just squeeze together the bra with the ket. And we look at this picture and we see it's actually just two loops. And that's where it's d squared by our Kaufman rules. I can do the same thing with two, two. So two on two, looks like this. Okay, there's the physical system in the middle. Okay, two particles, two holes. And then I have the bra, uh, sorry, the ket down here, the bra up here. That's again is two loops, that's d squared. But then if I wanna take uh, one, two, I want, there's the physical system in the middle. I take uh, the bra of one and the ket of two. And you'll notice that this thing is actually just one loop. It says D. So here we see that one inner product one is D squared, two inner product two is D squared, one inner product two is D, which tells you immediately that um, one and two are linear and independent kets. They span a, a two-dimensional uh, two dimensional Hilbert space. Unless D equals one, in which case uh, they don't. And that, that occurs actually, where is it? In this case, this so-called abelian state, where, where k equals one, if you plug in, plug in a, calculate d, you'll discover, discover that, that d equals one in that, that particular case. But other than that case, um, one and two are linearly independent. Now, um, you can do something uh, even more complicated, which is to, before squeezing these things together, you can you know, drag the particles around each other in some complicated way. Um, like this, oops, yes like this, goes behind, behind, behind like this, and then this guy like that. So you can make complicated knots like this, and then you get one braid operator one as your, as your, your matrix element. Now, this brings me back to the, the very beginning of my talk, where my title was, Why Should You Care About This? Well, I very cleverly named these, uh, named these cats one and two. But I, had I called them instead zero and one, you would have thought of, of a qubit, a quantum bit, a piece of, of information um, that can be manipulated with a quantum computer. And that's exactly what we intend to do. We would like to use these type of topological systems as, um, as qubits for a, a quantum computer. Um, now, uh, someone once said that every idiot with a two-state system thinks they have uh, a quantum computer. And um, uh, I'm going to try to prove to you that uh, you know, I'm not just, just a garden variety idiot and that it's actually not such a bad idea to try to do this. Um, so let me uh, try to, to flesh out what, what I mean a little bit by this, um, uh, this idea of, of quantum computing with, um, with knots. So the idea of, of quantum computing with knots is known as topological, uh, was there a question? Yeah, a very quick question. So the yeah. one not equal to two is only true in two dimensions. Is that correct? Um, right. Okay. So the um, so first of all, the, the topological theories are very different in in two plus one dimensions compared to three plus one dimensions. In three plus one dimensions, one cannot have um, uh, non-trivial braiding of 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 knots, of, of, of world lines, um, but you can have non-trivial braiding of world sheets in three plus one. So you can do things that are similar to this in, in three plus one, but the elementary particles are no longer point-like. Does that answer, answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I can come back to that question, that answer, which it probably seemed a little bit obtuse uh, at the end if it wasn't clear enough. Um, anyway, so the general idea of computing with, with knots like this is known as topological quantum computing. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's generally credited to two people, uh, Alexei Kateyev um, and Michael Friedman. So, uh, Alexei Kateyev is, is one of the brightest people in physics these days. He's the source of, of, of a huge number of extremely important ideas um, uh, in, in a vast number of fields. 
Michael Friedman is, is a mathematician. He's also a fields medalist for his work on, um, on the Poincaré conjecture way back in the 1980s. Kind of like this. Um, you imagine you have a, a two-dimensional system like this. And it, up here, we found that when we, when we had uh, two particles, two holes, we created a two-state, a possible two-state system or a qubit. So we're going to create many qubits by, okay, there's one qubit. Again, time runs vertically. Here's another qubit. Here's another qubit. Here's another qubit. We make as many qubits as we like by, by creating particle, antiparticle pairs uh, from the vacuum. Then in order to do some computation, you uh, braid the particles around each other um, in some complicated way um, and, and trying to figure out exactly which um, uh, uh, not that you, one wants to use to do certain computations is, is something that, that Nick and I uh, had a lot of fun with um, over the course of a number of years, a while back. Um, and then at the end of the day, oops, come back. Uh, at the end of the day, you bring the particles back together and you try to see whether they, um, whether they re-annihilate. And that's the output of, of your, of your um, that's the measurement uh, of your quantum computer, your output. Um, now, there's two things I need to convince you, and I realize I'm, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'll, I'll be fairly, fairly brief. Um, there's two things I need to convince you. The first thing I need to convince you is that you can actually do quantum computing this way. And, there's, uh, and the second thing I need to convince you is that you would want to. Um, so let's start with the first, that you could do quantum computing this way. Well, one way to, do, to convince you of this is to realize that I have some two-state system or a qubit system, and by braiding, you're doing some operation, some unitary operation. So I have a way to do, uh, to make my qubits. I have a way to do unitary operations on the qubit, so I should be able to do quantum computation. But there's sort of a more rough and ready way to uh, convince you you can do something interesting with this type of um, uh, uh, topological quantum computer. Um, which is to think back to the beginning of the, of the lecture where we talked about calculating Kalfman invariants. And we remembered that, that calculating Kalfman invariant is extremely hard. That if you have a, a system with um, you know, uh, 100 crossings, it would take a, 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 you know, the world's biggest computer a thousand years to calculate the Kalfman invariant. But suppose you actually have these physical system in your, in your laboratory you can actually make a very good estimate of the Kalfman invariant by actually you know, pulling the particles out of the vacuum like, like this, and then forming the knot physically, dragging the particles around to form the knot you're interested in. And then remember that the, you know, the probability of annihilating is the, is the Kalfman invariant squared. So you do the experiment many times and you can get a very good estimate uh, of the Kalfman invariant, which is something that a classical regular computer would not be able to do it in a thousand years. So it obviously has some computational ability beyond um, uh, what a classical computer uh, can do. Um, so the second part of the question is why would you want to do quantum computing this way? If you go back to my list here of, of the particular materials that people are interested in, these are all very finicky, difficult materials to work with. The truth is no one's even built a single qubit this way because these these physical systems are so hard to work with, um, despite a lot, of, uh, a lot of money being put in by uh, Microsoft into, into trying to develop this type of technology. Um, it still has not, not really succeeded in, in building a, a qubit this way. So why would you want to do it if it's a really hard way to build a computer, uh, a qubit? Um, and the answer to that lies in understanding uh, what, the, what the difficulty in quantum computing is. The difficulty in quantum computing is that quantum computers are exquisitely sensitive to noise. That in our typical picture of a quantum computer is that you have a bunch of two-state systems like spins, and you put the spins in some highly entangled, complicated uh, state. And, um, and you know, if a piece of noise, a little bit of noise comes in and flips over one of your bits, it creates an error. And you have to go to extreme lengths to protect your system from these sort of error processes. Now let's ask what happens if some noise arrives in your uh, topological quantum computing, quantum computer. Well, what happens is if the noise arrives, it will hit 
one of these particles and shake it around like that. And you know, so instead of taking a nice smooth path that you intended, it takes a wiggly path. But as long as you don't change the topology of the of the path that you 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 made, that you don't as long as you don't change the knot that you formed, then you've done. Oops, what just happened? Then you um, did exactly the, the same. Okay, we lost we lost the iPad, but I'm almost done anyway. Okay. That um, as long as you don't uh, change the um, the uh, oops, let me re reshare my screen. Um, as long as you don't change the topology of the knot, as long as you don't change the particular knot that you're you're considering, you haven't changed the computation at all. So in these topological quantum computers, you're inherently protected from um, from noise processes. So this is why people are 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 very interested in building. Oops, I didn't manage to share again. Let me try one more time. Um, your screen sharing ended. Let me try one more time. Share content, screen, start broadcast. Um, okay, so um, I think uh, that's actually since I've I've used up my my hour, uh, I could I could say more, but I think maybe it's it's better if I stop there, and and take questions. And if there are no questions, I can I can talk about um, some of the physical systems where we actually expect expect this to be. Um, this kind of physics to be realized. Um, but if, uh, uh, if there are questions, maybe it's better if I take the questions. And, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Steve, for very, very beautiful uh, and clear and, and very entertaining. I actually only at the last minute realized I should print up something that's or type, write something that says, ha ha, uh -huh. so I can laugh at your jokes. <laughs> yeah. So I'll distribute okay. these. <laughs> um, so, uh, I think first let's let me see if there are any uh, questions. And I see so I see I see I think now I see lots of hands. So I think Harrison, yeah, um, you're you're first here. So please. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, this is really a beautiful beautiful uh, presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, the the two rules that you showed at the start uh, to determine. Um, you know these two rules for for not involving a. Yep. Is that okay. is there any um, is it remotely any way to convince us those of us who are not mathematicians that that uh, those rules actually would be able to determine that any possible knot that you could form uh, could be could be sort of um, categorized uh, as distinct. I mean, yeah. it's not at all obvious that, that no, this okay. is sufficient. So, so first I should, I, I, okay. So there's, there's several things that to unpack in here, which, um, so in my, in my, in describing what a knot invariant is, what I said, I was very careful about how I said this, that if two knots um, are the same, they must have the same output. But it is not true that distinct knot uh, distinct knots, knots that cannot be deformed into each other, can't have the same output. So, okay. so the converse is okay. is not true. That you not could true. have two knots which are different, which actually do give the same output. Okay. Um, there are some examples. I mean, the, the simplest examples are fairly complicated knots, um, but there are known examples of two knots which are not the same knot, which actually have um, the okay. same Kalman so, weight. Okay, so, so what is known then, okay, so I'm sure I understand. What is known then is that if, if you have two, not in, two knots and they have different knot invariants, then they're not topologically equivalent. That's right. Okay. That, not, that's not that's the statement. Okay. That, that, that you know that they must be topologically uh, different if they have different knot invariants. But you do not know if they have the same knot invariant, they could be the same or they might be different. Yeah, actually, okay, it's, it's an open question. It's, it's a actually really interesting open question is if there is any not invariant, uh, if there's any not besides just a simple loop like this, the, who's, who's not invariant is just D. It is un, and if, so if you find a not and you put it in the rules and you get out an output of D, no one has found an example where it can't be simplified into just this. Yeah. But no one's been able to prove 
that you couldn't have one either. So that's okay. that's a, a important open question, and there are actually even debates in in mathematics, you know, news groups about whether they believe that uh, that the this not invariant will distinguish the will uniquely distinguish the unknot from all the other knots, or whether it's just that we haven't been creative enough to find the example of some really complicated knot who whose output is also D. Yeah, and if I wish, uh, just a physics question. So, so again, just to make sure I understand that the the, the the reason why, in principle, uh, building a quantum computer using the topological systems is that one one hopes that uh, the topological systems are more robust. Is that, is that that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. As a matter of fact, I mean, so okay. So I will ask uh, an answer a uh, question that I often get, which is that okay, you know, Google is out there right now. And they're they're leading the world and uh, mostly leading the world in in quantum computing, and they've done all sorts of amazing things in this in this last year. Done some really beautiful experiments, and um, these are all done with superconducting qubits and not not topological you know nonsense like 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 these particular uh, system. They're transmon qubits. It's completely different technology. Um, so why is it that we think that this is still an interesting? approach. Well, the one reason at least, or one justification for people still thinking about this, is that one of the things that you need to do with any quantum computer is you need to build error correction in somehow. Right. And the best known error correcting code, still by a lot of measures, is what's known as the toric code or the surface code. And basically what that, it, what that means is that you, you take all your qubits that you just worked really hard to, to build, and you tie them together in such a way that you construct a topological quantum field theory with them. You simulate a topological quantum field theory, and you're basically simulating a way to make your information topological. So there's such a close connection between quantum error correction and um, topological quantum field theories that you can understand these, um, these best error correcting codes as being Topological, topologically ordered matter, topological quantum field theories. And ju just this year, um, Google did um, a beautiful demonstration of uh, building the, the Toric code with you know, 21 qubits or something like that, the best error correcting code ever created. And it, it's basically just constructing a, a topological quantum field theory out of their 21 qubits. Okay. Well, thank you. Welcome. Greg, I see your hand is up. Yeah, it's Steve. Great talk. I laughed uh, you, 23 man. times. I hope that was neither more nor fewer than the number of jokes. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, which question is the better one to ask, but they're sort of related. I'm not clear in my own mind how you go from k equals 1 to k equals 2 in the SU2 symmetry group. But as an example, perhaps if you pick uranium tellurium 2, um, yeah. The department may recall that's the material that has the Lazarus superconducting phase that's re-entrant above 40 Tesla, uh, and, and you can decide to answer more of a UTE2, why that's um, a topological system, or how you get from different levels of SU2 yeah. theory. So, okay, so let me, so that's a, a tough, a tough uh, thing to answer. Um, so. All of these things that that fit in this in this SU two, I mean, the connection between between this this index and any sort of physics is is extremely roundabout. You know, it's it's very hard to draw a connect a, 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 an easy connection between them. So we're not going to do that. But what I will say is this: SU two level two is everything. Every time you hear the word Majorana, you should think right. SU two level two. And they're not precisely the same, strictly speaking. They're small little glitches, but it's basically the same thing. And in order to get a Majorana material, basically what you need is a, um, either a um, chiral P wave superconductor. Um, I mean, it used to be that the thing we wrote down on this list was francium ruthenate. Um, um, oh, that's not so right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, was, was strontium ruthenate, but with, um, Recent experiments, we're now starting to believe that maybe this thing should not be on the list. Um, right. But there's, uh, but these two materials have now shown up 
uh, on the list as being possibly chiral, chiral P wave superconductors in some part of their phase diagram. Um, you know, I, I, I have to admit that I haven't looked into these materials in great depth at this point. Um, so I, I can't speak too authoritatively about these two, but I, I did look at some of the data that seem to indicate that they're measuring, you know, zero modes and vortices, I think in, in this material. And, you know, it looked okay. I, I wouldn't say it was, it, was, um, it was perfect, but there is reason to believe that this one could be, um, could actually fit in that, in that category. It has some nice properties in terms of uh, the Fermi energy being quite low and the gap being quite high. Um, which by itself isn't enough. It still has to have the, um, the appropriate symmetry, but, but that's something that, that certainly will help once, once you have the right, the right symmetry. I mean, not everything here has to be strictly speaking a, a chiral P wave superconductor. I mean, helium 3A is basically a chiral P wave superconductor, but it's neutral particles. Um, uh, and nucleus five half state, it's a quantum Hall state, but it's essentially a chiral P wave superconductor in disguise. Um, the engineered Majorana materials. So these, they're basically chiral P wave superconductors, but they, they don't break time reversal or they don't break it very strongly. They, they sort of use this sort of topological insulator trick of uh, sort of replacing the time reversal breaking with strong spin orbit coupling. And uh, you know, there was a sort of a huge boom in, in people being all excited about this because it opened up a lot of new material combinations that will do this. So I think I'm not really answering your question in, in any reason way. I'm not sure I have a really, really good uh, explanation for how you get directly from this, this number two to the actual physics of the, of the material. Um, okay. So sorry about that. There was a workshop here in Los Alamos on UTE2 and strontium ruthenate. And suffice to say, the, um, the excitement is getting ever higher, but the clarity is not yet there yet. Yeah. So, I mean, I can tell you, since I spent a lot of time looking at the strontium ruthenate data, um, you know, a, a lot of the new data makes it look like, well, well, the old data is certainly wrong. That was, that was one thing, the one that, that made it look like it was clearly a chiral P wave superconductor. But still, there are enough experiments that you, um, you really don't want to throw out, that you really think they're pretty reliable experiments, and they don't all fit together. But right. I think the, the, the superconducting symmetries that are now in the mix include, include a bunch that, are, that don't break time reversal. Um, and so it could be one of those, or you know, the, the ones that do break time reversal could possibly be still in the mix, but, it, but then you'd ha you have a lot of explaining to do as far as the NMR experiments. So it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely, an, it's still an interesting, well, it, I mean, I, I think it's, um, you know, Steve Kibbleson who said, you know, strontium ruthenate, it's incredibly well characterized material. There's been thousands of very good experiments done on this. It's very clean. It, um, you know, above TC, it's a really good Fermi liquid. If we can't figure out what's going on in strontium ruthenate, we should all just pack our bags and go home. You know, this is the simplest system we could possibly imagine. And we still don't understand what's going on despite you know, 30 years of, 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 of really good experiments and a lot of, of very um, good theory. So this is a, a bit of a slap in the face to our community of not being able to figure out what's happening. Thank you, great talk. Thank you. Taki, I think you're, you're next. Yes, um, can you, uh, thank you for, thank you very much for a great talk. Can I uh, look at the, your last slide? Yeah so, this one? I, yeah. yeah, so I feel like I'm missing something very fundamental here. So like, so, so to measure, so this, to calculate this probability between any given initial and final state, you know, I would, so I fix initial and final state and I would be summing over all possible in, intermediate states. Then I would be uh, summing uh, over yeah. all possible different Kaufman invariants. So how could yeah, you measure okay. the individual Kaufman? Yeah, okay. That's, it's a very good question. Okay. Um, so what I'm envisaging here is that when we, when you, you control the position of the particles. So imagine that when, when you create a particle by putting in energy, you don't let them free. You trap them in, in some potential well, some local potential well. And yeah, so in, in the sort of Feynman way, you, 
you're integrating over all possible things that can do, this can do, but basically it's just forming a bound state in that well. So it's not gonna, it, it, it sits in the, very happily in this bound state in the well, and then you can adiabatically move the wells around to make them form whatever knot you want. And you can fix it such that the, you know, it's, um, you're basically 100% certain that the particles took you know, up to the size of the well, basically took one path that you choose. So you can pick out whichever Kaufman invariant, whichever knot you want by adiabatically moving these wells around and then to the output. Does and that so, so, that's, so you can do that while maintaining quantumness of the system. That, doesn't, that does not make the system classical? Yeah, no, this still, the, the quantumness is hidden in this, um, uh, is hidden in this degeneracy between states here. The, mm. the quantumness, uh, um, uh, you know, even if, if you fix the position, you still have two wave functions mm -hmm. and you are manipulating the Hilbert space of these, of these wave functions. And it still is a quantum system in, in that respect, even though the positions of the particles is now, is now classical. I see, thank you. You're welcome. That was a good question. Oscar? I should probably be more clear about it, yeah. Hi, Steve. Uh, very nice talk. Um, oh, thank you. I have a, um, I have a question um, regarding the current technology. So uh, the materials you mentioned, as you said, they are very finicky and that means that the gaps to the excitations uh, are not uh, that large, which means in the adiabatic, li adiabatic limit, of course, everything goes through, but there's a practical question of a rate at which one can do yeah. these um, operations. Sure. Um, otherwise, we're no longer in the adiabatic limit. And uh, right. presumably, we lose the uh, protection from the topology. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so for the surface code, um, what sort of rates for braiding uh, can one envision in Hertz? Um, so, um, you mean, you mean for the, for like the, for the Google surface code, for example, um, I think it, it's, it's actually, it's quite fast. Um, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I'm not sure I know the numbers offhand, but I think the, the switching, you know, they, they can do operation. Uh, so I know numbers for, for the, for the IBM machine. And you know operations are done in in microseconds, um, and coherence times are are milliseconds. So this you so, can do braiding. You can do braiding in that time scale. No, no, that, that's that's an that's an elementary operation, a single right. gate. Um, then you know, so surface code. Okay, so surface code is quantum memory. Um, it you don't get much out of braiding in the surface code. You need a slightly more advanced uh, code, which they haven't built yet. I mean. It's, it's just a matter of having more, you need more qubits and slightly more complicated gates. Um, so it hasn't been done, done yet. Um, but it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, at this point, there's you know, a, a factor of a, of a thousand or, or more in the number of operations you can do in a coherence time. Um, and uh, it, it, Google's might be better than IBM's actually. So I'm, I'm quoting the numbers for the IBM machines that I've I've looked into, and and these are the, you know, they're they're, you know, the cheap machines that you don't have to pay to <laughs> you don't have to pay to use, and probably if you pay for the pay for the good stuff, they'll get you'll get a better better factor, um, uh, but then in order to uh, manipulate things, there's a lot of elementary gate operations that would be required to move one thing from here to here, um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's it's going to be a challenge. Uh, but the, the advantage of, um, of using these uh, uh, topological systems is, is the protection you get can be extremely good. Um, so and the, I mean, the, the, the demonstration that was done in this first paper by Google is, is really quite, quite impressive. They go through 50 rounds of error correction successfully um, you know, in, in the first paper and, and they show that that's no, no problem. So it's basically, um, you know, they can, they can basically press down the, the error limit almost arbitrarily at this point. So they, they, you know, they, you know, they're only storing two bits, but, but still they're, they're, they've managed to get the, the, the fidelity of these, of these 
the decoherence time of these um, uh, these two bits to be you know really arbitrary. So it's it's really really good um, quality work. Now you could ask also about about these physical systems here. Um, they all have very small excitation gaps, like you know helium three a. It's a, you know it's a fraction of a millikelvin. You know, and you know, even some of these systems, um, you know, it's maybe it's Kelvin or something like that, maybe several Kelvin if you're really lucky. Um, so you might worry that the, um, you know, adiabatic might be very slow, but fortunately, in, in any real physical system, you know, a, a Kelvin is is um, is a lot of gigahertz. You know, 20 gigahertz is a Kelvin. So even if you can, um, you can only operate at a, at a tiny fraction of the excitation gap, the excitation gap can be really small and you can still operate pretty quickly. And at the end of the day, the speed of your quantum computer isn't all that important because you're getting an exponential speed up over what a classical computer can do. Thank you. You're welcome. So are there uh, any other questions? Maybe I can ask a question that just occurred to me um, during your talk. Although this, this is probably like many questions I'm asking these days, it's probably something I've, I've forgotten. I'm getting, we probably talked about before. Uh, since some of these, for even just these K values are for these anions, they're more powerful for computing than others. Presumably that, means the Kaufman bracket is easier to calculate. You can calculate it classically efficiently for SU2 right. level two, but is that also true for the other weird, like I forget K equals there. Are, anyway, you, yeah, you get the question. I, we probably talked yes. about it before, but I forgot, so. We did. So um, uh, it is true. Um, so this one is, is the one that, that would be really nice to, to play with in a, in, in a real quantum computer. This one's universal for quantum computation. You can do everything you want with SU2 level three. The problem is the 12 fifths fractional quantum Hall state is really, really small gap. And it's only seen in the very highest mobility samples. Um, it's sort of like a much more difficult version of this one. And this one's being used to do experiments and those experiments have already not been very clear. Um, I mean, ideally we would like to use, use this one because you can do, it's, it's sort of maximally power for, powerful for quantum computation. So, SU2 level two is, a, is not universal for quantum computation, as, as you pointed out, neither is SU2 level four, but all of it, everything else above four is. Um, and um, so that raises the question, why are we so interested in SU2 level, level two if you can't actually do all quantum computations by braiding particles around each other? Um, and um, there, there's, there's several reasons for this. One is it's kind of a lamppost problem you look under the lamppost because the light is better there. Um, and these are the physical systems that looks like we might be able to make in the lab easily. So let's do it and see what we can learn from it. Um, but there's another reason, which is that um, they, they can make a perfectly good uh, topological memory, um, even if you can't do uh, computation with them. Um, but also um, it turns out that the, um, if you, if you wanna make them universal quantum computation, you need to add um, some operations which are not topologically protected, regular operations, regular, you know, the, the kind of you know, spin rotations or things like that that you would do in a regular quantum computer, which are not protected topologically and they're, they're you know, hard to control and so forth. But the thing is having some gates um, which you can do topologically and presumably those gates are extremely accurate and are extremely well protected having a few gates which are extremely accurate enables your tolerance on how badly you do the other gates to be much, much higher. That the, the argument is that in, you know, if you can do some gates topologically with SU2 level two, um, the gates which are not protected topologically can be off by 10% and still you'll be able to complete the computation uh, correctly. So that's what one hopes to do with with, with this uh, category. Sure. Okay, well, unless there are any other questions,
Uh, can I ask one? Oh question? yes, please. Sure. So, thank you for that great talk. And I'm wondering, like, on this very simple example, like a plane sur two-dimensional surface, to have some non-topo non-trivial non topology, it looks like a you need at least two pairs or maybe more pairs. And I'm wondering, like, a, if one can do by single pair, if the the two-dimensional surface has a hole or something, and yeah. then can yeah. you do it so, or yes. is it more difficult or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, th this is uh, this is exactly what, what one does with the, with, the tor with the toric code or the so-called surface code is one, um, you, you can gain something by cutting holes in your surface. Mm. You, you can, you get more, more amount, more freedom of more options of what you can do and what you can store by, by cutting holes in surface. And this is exactly what's done with the toric code. Um, and, and I guess, Strictly speaking, it's, it then goes by a slightly different name of the surface code. Um, once you cut holes in the in the surface, but it's exactly the same thing, except that you cut holes in the surface, and then you call it the surface code. But but it is exactly that that trick that you give yourself more topological options by by cutting holes in the surface. So yes, that's, that's useful. It gives you um, you know more places to store memory, basically. Okay, if, um, if there aren't any more questions, let me remind everyone that Steve will be talking again tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, about, about the Toric code. I think he's already sort of mentioned some of the interesting issues there and the connection with what he talked about today. So hopefully uh, you can join us then. And uh, otherwise, I think we can we can end this session. Thank you. Let me join me in thanking Steve one more time for really a wonderful talk. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.